circle jerks, fear, and stuff like that, just to you know make it make a difference. So I borrowed, yeah. So that's really self self employed. I got myself on by having an idea and executing on it. Tell us how you worked your way up at Rush Def Jam. Okay, so um, first of all, before there was Def Jam, there was Rush, as you know. Um, we were on 26th Street. So tell us how you worked your way at the management company. There's, there's really, there's not really working your way up. We 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 were both there. Um, the office was these two chairs put together, and and Russell never showed up to the office. No, it was working your way up. I can tell you if you don't remember. Okay. I'll so, tell you what working your way up I'm, is. I'm, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the long and short of it, and okay. try to make it quick because he'll remix it. And <laughs> it's going to be so complimentary. The the real deal is that when I landed to New York, I went straight to the office, and I thought there was going to be a marching band for me. And when I walked into the office, everybody looked depressed. And Russell never told anybody that I was coming to join the company. So, and Russell has never showed up at the office. So when I busted in with my suitcase and says, I'm now part of this company, they all looked at me like I had nine heads. Like, and they were all depressed. And I said, why is everybody depressed? They said, well, Run DMC is at the airport going to London. And their road manager is on a binge and can't be found, and he's the only one with a passport. I said, well, I have a passport. They said, can you make it to the JFK? And so I went to JFK, they recognized me from the show, and from that moment on, I was Run DMC's road manager for three and a half years. So there was no, and we didn't miss one gig, and our crew was five. Joey, the, this is a real new generation. So, so, I knew culturally you were running a lot on the road, but I seen you come home and you could do the wild. So I knew you had all the slick flavor thing down, but I heard you particularly learned a lot from Jam Master J. So Jam Master J was the most uh, focused. Joey was certainly the inspiration, and D was the attention to the details. But Jay was so curious, so um, jo Joey and Dee would go straight to the hotel, and Jay would go to the spot, the local spot, to understand what's going on, meet the local DJ. We would, we would find ourselves in a lot of very interesting spots, but more about learning. He was curious, and it was so critical for me to watch him. He's the one who taught me how to settle a show, get pick up the money. It was, it was just amazing. And, you know, I miss him most definitely every day. There's not a day that goes by that I don't remember that smile. He had the most beautiful smile. He was the most optimistic person. A glorious, glorious man. <laughs> Talk about how that came about and how it changed. You broke it, the uh, famous Run DMC Adidas deal. So, thematically in my, my life, just so you understand, um, the DNA of my life was through Rush and Def Jam. And Def Jam, the architecture of Def Jam was about black and white and shades of gray. Prior to that, there was this aspirational desire of, uh, uh, I'll just leave it as aspirational. If ever anybody remembers or knows, which I doubt because you're just a bunch of new people here. Um, but back in the day, they used to wear sequins and leather, the Furious Five, um, Cold Crush, tell me you don't know Cold Crush brothers. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait a second, is this the old music or is this the young, young music executive conference? 
anyhow, the Cold Crush Brothers, they were all in sequins, leather, and everything like that. And then Run DMC represented to more of the person that you could identify with back um, in your neighborhood. And that's really the architecture of Def Jam. Def Jam was about um, the simplicity of the lyrics and the beat and the experience of what was happening. Um, and it was less about aspiration. We actually left the aspiration for uptown and, and bad boy recorders, right? So truthfulness is part of the DNA of, of that experience. Not dreaming. So Run DMC actually loved their Adidas. It wasn't fraudulent. It wasn't trying to try to get a check. DMC would clean his Adidas every night because we roomed together. And every night he would clean every pair of his Adidas. I said, why are you cleaning that? It was in your luggage. You didn't wear those. He would clean religiously his Adidas because he didn't want a speck of dirt on it. They loved the Adidas. I don't know, something attracted them to that brand. So it wasn't me who made that deal. It was smart people understanding the truthfulness of Run DMC loving and becoming so popular that, and, and it didn't look like they were endorsing Run DMC um, um, Adidas. It was just part of the fabric of the company and, and the group. And that's simply the theme of my life is not, I'm not trying to concoct things and sell things and I'm not, we're not traders. We're not like on 42nd Street, hey, you don't want this, how about that? We actually want to participate in the most truthful representation of art that, that, that we could be a part of. So when you say that, that it was organic, and I get that, but didn't you go out your way to meet the Adidas guy? You get me come to Madison Square Garden and see the show. Yeah, it, but that's well, that's a part of the story you want to hear. That, but but that that's about me. No, it, and, no. And, 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 the running point, you made sure that we know that that was their natural course of order. Your job was to take advantage of their natural things that were truthful. It was a very simple. It's a very simple job. When 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 there is an arena in a country of people wearing their Adidas because they're following a group that they have fallen in love with, and that group is not selling them something, but something that is important to them. All, all it is is a simple invite, and, and for them to see it firsthand. And, and, you know, people give me way too much credit for something that anybody could have done. Right. But it wasn't done before you. That was one of the first endorsement deals. Time. Timing is everything. True that. Okay. You were with Rick Rubin during the Beastie Boy era. What was that like? Um, that was chaotic and um, very interesting. A lot of learning experiences. As you, everybody knows, the Beastie Boys left us after they sold 10 million albums. So imagine that we were broke, struggling, record executives that own the company and then suddenly you have something that is so profound and sells 10 million albums and then you know we're 21 23 24 years old having no experience and because of a legal um, aspect of our contract they're able to um, leave us um, very painful and part of my education, which has been, I think, really valuable to me, is I've done every possible mistake and still found my way to stay on the court. And so can you imagine that your artist sells 10 million albums and then they leave you? It's painful and it was hard to, you know, recover from that. but. Fortunately, we did, and we kept moving, and we'll never make those mistakes again. So, 
How did the company change after Russell started Fat Farm and was no longer there for the day to day and you were the chief operating officer? So, uh, you know, you say about leaving for Fat Farm, but Russell left five years earlier to California to make movies. So, the Russell is, and I were roommates together. We spent 23 hours a day together for many, many years. I knew exactly the way Russell wanted it. And also what Russell wanted was for us to populate the company with really successful people. Russell always, Russell taught me, just hire people smarter and better than you are, and you'll be okay. And so I spent my lifetime, you know, finding and bumping into Kevin Lyles. Kevin Lyles had, um, um, put that company on his back and the greatest growth of our, of our company was when Kevin was the, the, the president of the company. Hired Julie Greenwald, she is like, this, this, it's impossible, no one can touch her. So my gift, because Russell taught me, was just populate your company with people that are dedicated, smarter, more gifted. It's okay to be the dumbest person in the room. I'm fine with it. It's, it's not a big problem for me. Um, especially if they're on your team. One of your biggest signings at the end when you bought Rockefeller deal and Jay-Z. Tell us about that. So, the real story is that they tried to jack um, the Foxy Brown record from me. Okay. And that's the real thing that happened. And I wasn't having it. So, so, so um, you know, it's, I'm like the first person that said no. Uh, and so they came to see us. Uh, and they actually went to Kevin to try to, you know, um, um, slide Kevin uh, a, a sack of money uh, to, you know, work records on the side for them. And I think, you know, people know that I'm ready to fight for my ship. And I'm not a glad hander. So that, there was a moment of recognition, like if the ship was on the other side, we'll do the same thing. So why don't we, why don't we work together with this, this company? And so that's what, that's what happened, you know. It actually was because we said, no, that's not going down that way. And then when they thought, well, after they got a, you know, past the shop that someone said no to them, they recognized that they would have done the same. That's the actual thing that happened. But the macro thing that happened is about two years earlier, Russell came up to me upset. Man, I want to be on the cover of Vibe magazine. And they're not doing that. And they got Shug on the cover of Vibe and Puffy on the cover of Vibe. And man, it's pissing me off. They're just interested in new energy. And I said, Russell, let me explain to you. So, um, let me explain to you what's going on. We're going to be the amco of this. Okay? We're going to, every morning, pretend like we're getting in our blue overalls, and we're going to have people come, and we're going to help them drop their transmission and get them out, service them, and get them out. Now, bad boy with their Versace suits don't want oil on them. And um, death row all swollen up. They can't fit underneath. <laughs> so the only blue collar company out here was Def Jam. Or you go to a major and there was no cultural recognition. I couldn't out Shook Night Shook Night and out um, um, Puffy Puffy. Um, so what we were is the AMCO. And so when Rockefeller was analyzing being partners with someone, they knew we weren't trying to 
dance in their videos and slap our logos um, on there, that we just wanted to do a great job for them and their artists. And that, so that's the, the, the reason why we were even able to do that right there. Yeah, so just so for clarity's sake, if you guys are trying to figure it out. You eventually left Island Def Jam Music Group to take over as chairman and CEO of the Warner Music Group. What were the differences between running a boutique label to a major label? So I turned down um, the job to, every time I, I turn down jobs, because I like what I have. I, I'm never, I, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to be the best of what, what I have. And it was uh, real problematic when I decided to go to Warner. I wasn't hired to be the chief executive officer. I was hired to be the chief artistic officer for the company. It turned out that it ended up being the chief executive officer. And it's also part of me learning words and the reality of the situation is my wife at the time said to me, you know, I was explaining to her, there was no hero in that job. I didn't ever aspire to be Tommy Matola, Walter Yetnikoff, or any of those people. My heroes were Chris Blackwell, Ahmed Erdogan, you know, you understand what I'm saying? So, she said to me, she just turned to me and said, just make it your own. So I tried to make the Warner um, job my own. So I redefined the, 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 the idea of that job. And I felt like it was important for us to distinguish ourselves different from Universal, different from Sony, by being the most creative, most a esque most artist-centric large company. And that's what I try to do. You've been known as a fierce competitor with a no BS approach to business. How would you describe your leadership and your maturity of style now? I feel like I'm the same person. You may disagree. I, I'm sure you want to disagree. I'm the same person that I was before. I want bad news before good news. Everybody wants to run and tell me good news. I can wait on good news. The reason why I don't have security, I don't walk with around with security. I touch more rappers, more rap business than all of them combined was because I always told my partners and artists bad news before good news. A thorough person has plan B and plan C and D. A thorough person could only get upset with you if you retard their ability to go to plan B by sugarcoating or giving them some crap. So our industry is about glad handing and